Hello, I'm Donna Scal. And I'm Tiffany Ross. Welcome to Roaring Lambs. You know, Roaring Lambs is all about telling your story of what God has done in your life. Now imagine this, your mother sells you, your, her child, to a stranger at age 11. But that child escapes. Stay tuned for an amazing story of God's grace. This episode of Roaring Lambs is brought to you by LifeStoriesCompany.com. Do you believe in divine appointments? I do, because when I met our guest, Debbie, it was a divine appointment. I had no idea what God had in store for the two of us. Uh, Debbie Buffoni uh, came through a testimony workshop, and when I heard her story, it was a story I just never forgot. But then Debbie uh, sought to volunteer with Roaring Lambs, and she has been incredibly valuable to us. She helps out with our Sunday morning Bible study. She edits and airs all of our radio shows and soon-to-be TV shows. Uh, she is just incredible, and we're so excited to have Debbie Buffoni. But I said it was a divine appointment, not only for what Debbie could do for Roaring Lambs, but what Debbie does for me. Debbie is a spiritual daughter I never had, and I just love her to death, and I know you will too. Mm -hmm. So Debbie, it is a story, and stories always have a beginning. So we love to start at the beginning. I know that you were born and raised in Brazil. Uh -huh. So tell us a little bit more about your upbringing. Yeah, I was born in the south, the northeast of Brazil if that matters. Um, it was, it, it's a beautiful place. And if you have never been to Brazil, I would say that it should be on a bucket list. Um, but I, I was um, born into two people who had been in a very difficult situation. My mother was a prostitute. And my father was, well, the troublemaker and the black sheep of, um, an Italian family who had immigrated from Italy to Brazil. And when I was born, neither of one of them wanted a child. So they left me in the hospital. I was born with underdeveloped lungs, and I was left in the hospital for a couple of days after she was released, after I was born. But they made a, um, arrangements for me to be taken from the hospital from somebody else because she had made an arrangement to pay another family to take care of me when I was released from the hospital. Well, and even before your mom had you, I know that she tried to abort you yes. several times yes. because she really didn't want to be pregnant or have a child. That's correct. I, I learned later that she tried to, to abort me three times, but- Three um, times. Three times, wow. yeah. On the third time, she was told to just forget it, and you, ne you need to let this pregnancy go through. And then whatever happens when the baby's born, you give the baby away. And that's exactly what she did. So I, I used to say, you know, if I had any dreams in my life, that was to meet my, my biological mother. Because I, for nine months, I was in her womb, and all I could hear was her heartbeat. Yes. And I wanted to, to meet the owner of that heartbeat. But when I was born, all I could see was rejection because my parents were not there for me. So Debbie, I'm thinking of this word, you know, abandonment, really. Mm -hmm. um, you were abandoned. And, you know, so many people can experience that in different ways. Maybe kids are latchkey kids and their home, parents are never home and they feel abandoned or a parent dies. But it's something else to have your biological mother cut, cut ties, literally, and say somebody else can take care of you. Did you struggle with these um, emotions of abandonment? Absolutely, yes. yes. Like I said, you know, in the beginning, I had no idea what was, go what was going on. Yeah. And it was a very dysfunctional family that I was sent to. But when I came to, to uh, an age where I could ask questions and could realize that I d didn't even look like these, the people, and they were l always making sure that they would say, you know, somebody asked, who is this little girl? And instead of 
her saying, oh, that's my little girl, I, you know, she would say, well, it's somebody that I take care of. Mm -hmm. And uh -huh. I grew up with that. And then sometimes even I would um, pretend that they were m my parents. You know, I needed a mother. I needed a father. And I was not even allowed to call mom or dad mm -hmm. because I was not theirs. And um, to be honest, even, even a birth certificate I didn't have for a long time. I was under the radar mm -hmm. because nobody even took care of that specific thing. So yes, it was hard for me to know that my, my friends could go back from school to their mom, mommy and daddy and mm -hmm. I didn't have that. Mm -hmm. So on, from a very early age, I developed a very low self-esteem because I thought if my mother and my father did not want me, who wants me? Uh, well, maybe I did something wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm not good enough. So that it was haunting me throughout my first years. Yeah. You know, Debbie, but since we've become friends mm -hmm. and very close friends, uh, we vacation together, we spend a lot of time together, we eat together, yeah. we, <laughs> we have fun together. I would have never known about your upbringing by meeting you today. God did something when you were born. He implanted within you an ability to deal with chaos and to deal with confusion. And, mm -hmm. and he even gave you an ability to bury the wo wounds that you have from your early childhood. You didn't know it then, but now uh, that I see you as an adult, I just marvel at the way God did that for you. So tell me a little bit about your early spiritual beginnings. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, it's almost like sometimes I'm talking about somebody else's life, not mine. Yes. And I truly believe that was a godly thing. I, I believe that my, my, my soul, my spirit was guarded by God. It was right. a supernatural thing because things that I had to go through as a child, no child should go without any scars or, um, I'm not saying that I'm perfect and I don't have any scars, I do. Anxiety, I, I do have sometimes, and it's hard to control because, um, you know, I lived my days always on these, uh, fl um, how do you say, flight or fight, mm -hmm. yes. you know, because I was always, I was taking care of myself. I mm -hmm. was raising myself. Mm -hmm. Did I, I, I had, at the place that I was living, I had some even criminals in the house. Mm -hmm. And I had really to take care of myself. I had some predators in the neighborhood and it's not like I, I belong to anyone. So um, nobody was there to claim me as their responsibility. So right. I was my own responsibility. But at the very early, um, some of the families started taking me to their churches. And um, I really remember that I was probably five years old and there was this teacher and she had a picture behind her on the wall. And I, I, I wanna go there every weekend because I want to see, not the teacher, but I want to see the picture behind her because it caught my eyes. It was the, this be beautiful picture of this man seen, sitting on a rock in a garden with some kids around him. Mm -hmm. And there was something about this man that caught my attention. And not even, not just that, but there was a little girl sitting on the lap of that man. Mm -hmm. And she was looking at his hands, like asking him, some questions about the wound that he had in his hands. And he was like giving her all the attention and that's exactly what I needed as, as a mm -hmm. child. Be someone that just get the attention of someone that would be just there to answer questions and to love me and to give me some time. And later on somebody told me that that was Jesus. Mm -hmm. and, and then I learned that Jesus had a father and I started to feel sorry for Jesus because well, a father abandons the child. That's mm -hmm. what I, I, I experienced. So I became very close to that Jesus because I could relate to his pain of being abandoned by, because see, I, I didn't understand yet. I had not understood that Jesus is God. You know, it's yeah. the, the beautiful and the mystery of the Trinity, but I was taught to separate them and that's what I was doing and very afraid of God. But I, I started a relationship with Jesus, and it was mm. deeper and deeper. 
he was strong, he was my best friend. I would come, he who was my confidant and I would just spend time with Jesus, not knowing yet that he was my savior. Because some of the homes that you were put in when you were in foster care in Brazil, uh, they actually believed in different things. Some of them believed in what we might call a cult today. Some yes. of them were just very legalistic. Yes, you had I, a wide range I, of spiritual beginnings. Yes, I, I, I knew that I had, I was Jewish by my mother's side, but also I had not only that, I had, um, I had some cultic experience and I had also very legalistic experience and not only that there was some witchcraft going on also wow. so it was a mixture of many things and I praise God that I did not turn to any one of these paths America. because mm -hmm. Jesus was with right. me that's him alone uh, oh that's so wonderful because yes I mean only Jesus could have uh, protected you and guided you as right. he did and given you the, right and given you the comfort that that young girl needed so desperately. And you know, we relate in many ways, Debbie, not only are we, uh, we share almost the same birthday. <laughs> yes, we but, do. But, You're older though. Yeah, you know, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I just made the connection. So I was not abandoned by my mother, but by my father. And I, I didn't grow up with a dad, nor did you really. And yet, I think we both have this inner sense of wanting others to feel belonged, you yes. know, that they belong. Yes. And um, God ha can use a lot of that, uh, those abandonment issues to, you know, heal us through Him, but also help others belong, right? But this issue of Father, um, you know, I, Jesus was an easy uh, learn for me growing up. I grew up in the church, and so Jesus was easy. He was my brother. He was my friend. He was my savior. But God as father was a hard concept for me to connect with. And I'm wondering how has God helped you in that aspect of who he is? Yeah, it, it was hard for me because like I said, I was separated in the persons of the Trinity, yeah. right? I was yes. thinking is Jesus is one person, yes. God is. But when I came to realize that God is God, Jesus is also God. Yes. And God created me and God died on the cross for me and God comforts me through the Holy Spirit and God comes back to me one day very soon to take me to him to for, for my eternal life so God is God there's no separation mm -hmm. we cannot deeply understand the mystery of Trinity yeah. but Jesus um, in the last chapter of the book of John, he says, go make disciples and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Who am I to question that? Mm -hmm. If Jesus said that, I just have, I don't fully understand because my mind is, my body is not glorified yet, so I cannot fully understand, but one day I will. Mm -hmm. Now I just accept because Jesus is my God. Yes. Yeah. And my Savior. Mm -hmm. right. My Creator. Right. So you went from house to house as a child, mm -hmm. uh, different foster care, mm -hmm. and I know that you said the great desire of your heart was to meet the woman who owned the heartbeat mm -hmm. that you listened to for nine months. And sure enough, you did get to meet your mother at some point. Yes. Tell us that story. Yeah, it was um, when, I, when I said that I, I, I came to an age where I started making asking questions and make some assumptions about my um, first when I was born and what happened to my mom why did she reject me where's my father why don't I look like these people and I started to dream and then I would just go to school and then just um, pretend that my teacher was going to be my mother you know I would just fantasize that she would just at the end of the day say hey class I have something to tell you I found out that I'm Debbie's mother and I'm gonna take her to live with me now mm. and mm. yeah and then I would um, some one day somebody took me to a church and I really liked the pastor so I went to the pastor and asked him um, if he was my father mm. because you know I wanted that I want a daddy to take care of me I want a mother to 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 love me and um, I did not have that but I knew 
that my mother one day was coming back because there was always the promise. Oh, your parents, and I would hear that. Oh, I'm taking care of her here, but her parents will come back. So I was longing for my parents mm. to come back to get me. And yes, one day I came back. I was at the house. I don't remember really the details of before, but I can clearly see in my, my head, in my mind, the day that my mother came. Mm. And it was this beautiful woman that just showed up there with another beautiful woman that later I found out was my sister. Mm. Well, I later found out that that my sister that I met was actually born a boy and went to Switzerland and had, um, was a transgender actually, had surgery and became mm. a, a woman. I mean, never be, but you know what I'm trying to say. Yes. She was a transgender. <coughs> and, um, you know, back then, you know, it's not like something that's happening right now. But I see it, it was, I was 11 years old and I could see that happening already. So they came in and it was just amazing because, oh my gosh, my mother was there in front of me. I was very nervous. Um, but she, she, I had the whole future now. My mm -hmm. dream had come true. So she did take me with her um, first. Uh, she, they were staying at a hotel, and um, they took me to the hotel, and it was amazing because you know there were money going everywhere, and I could get whatever I wanted, and they were just like giving me everything they could because just making me happy, I guess. Mm -hmm. And there was a pool um, in the hospital, on the hospital in the hotel, and I. It was just amazing because, you know, growing up by the ocean, you don't care really about um, pools. And um, because you just, I mean, you don't care about the ocean because you have the ocean all the time. But when you get a pool, you would just like, oh, give me the pool. It's the opposite here, living in dollars. You only have pools, right? Mm -hmm. You want the ocean. So when I saw that pool, I mean, like, that's all I wanted. I wanted to spend the whole day in the pool. And that's what I did. And um, so, um, there was um, one time when one of the days uh, somebody was watching me and um, later we came back to the room and uh, there was an argument with my mother and my half sister. And I could not tell, tell you exactly what was going on, but they were fighting over me because my sister didn't want her to take me to where she said um, she was going to take me. And I could not understand because my mother, all she said was, do you wanna go upstairs later for the to play at night in the pool with a friend of mine and of course i wanted and i just yeah. i didn't understand what my sister was doing why are you you know no don't do this i, I want to go i want to play in the pool especially at night i've not, never done that yes show me the friend i want to go mm -hmm. but she knew exactly what was going on and she was trying to stop my mother from giving me to the man that she had already accepted half the payment for me at that hotel and because of this argument, they decided not to deliver me to the men, and we had to flee the hotel that night. So she took me back to the, the place where I had been living before, and for many years I never saw them again. Oh my wow. goodness. <clears throat> but I remember when you shared it at the testimony workshop, you went to the pool that night, and y y for some reason you knew probably in your spirit that it was wrong and you escaped you ran up some steps and yeah. almost slipped I, on them i i did i fell i i th there was a like a four or five steps from the the deck where the pool was to the elevators and i i i fell through these stairs going to, to the the elevator and this man he came behind me and actually he helped me he picked me up and then helped me to get the elevator so, um, yeah. And then after that, your mother kind of disappeared from your life mm -hmm. again. She had tried to sell you to this stranger, to this man. You had escaped that situation. Mm -hmm. And so she went back with your half sister brother uh, <laughs> yeah. to wherever they were yeah, whatever at that they were doing time. Before. Uh -huh. So yes. then you went back into the foster system? Yes, uh -huh. I went back to where I was <clears> before <throat> and then life went as normal, <laughs> if you could, could call that normal. The abuse escalated and, um, but there was something that my mother s did. Well, it, 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 there was something that happened later, you know, much later, like maybe five, six years ago 
with that matter because I grew up with that haunting me, knowing that my mother had sold me to that man in the, in the hotel. And, um, but I went to Brazil six years ago, and I was invited to speak at a church. I did not know the church, and I did not know anyone that was, I had a few friends, and this specifically this couple who invited me. So I got there, and I'm giving the testimony, and um, so then I, I, all of a sudden I'm telling them my story that I had never told them any, any before, which is the story of when my mother was um, sold me. And then I told them the details. And I, I, I felt like very uncomfortable some, because it was like, you know, why am I, say, I, I, why am I saying this? Mm -hmm. I felt a little ashamed even. You know, my like, God, why am I saying all this now? It doesn't matter. Because you hadn't planned I had not planned that. at all. And I just gave all the, the details. And um, at the end, I was in the back of the church talking to some friends that had come to, to hear me. And I saw the pastor coming, and he he was he had his arm around this man, and he said, "Well, Debbie, you need to hear this. You guys need to hear this story." So I see them approaching, and they're both crying. I'm like, "What? What is going on?" So they come, and there's like maybe ten friends with me, and then we're and he comes and he he says, "I was the man who who bought who bought you." Oh my goodness! And he said, "Well, remember when?" You, you needed help falling down the steps, I helped you. And what really never left my mind was that your mother, I gave her half the price already and she never really delivered me to you, to, uh, delivered you to me. And, um, and then he became a believer and he was baptized, baptized at the church and he said that but that um, fact that he knew that he was a predator, that he was a pedophile and he had bought a little child never left him and he could never for, never forgive himself mm -hmm. so now God gave him this present mm -hmm. to see this grown woman talking about the amazing work of God in her life and that's that's the little girl that I bought and then he asked me to forgive him and oh. I how could I not Debbie, we hugged. Oh. there was not a dry eye no. dry eye around us yeah not at all. That, that only God could only have God given could. that divine appointment yes. like that. Well, yeah. Oh, my goodness. And to have this healing, you know, uh, this uh, full circle moment, if you will, I know there was another moment in your life that you thought would be full circle and this wonderful dream come true in connecting with your dad. Yes. What happened there? <clears throat> Well, after my mother left me, there was one thing that she had told me at the hotel, that I had the father, and she knew where he was. And for me, that was an amazing revelation because I always wanted to meet him. So now, but I was too young to go look for him, and I knew that I could not count on the, the families that I was staying with. So I held on to the information until later when I was almost going to high school already, and I was junior high. And so I decided to to go look for my father. And I did that. And I went to find my father and I found him. And now, because I knew that I could not belong to my mother anymore because she had come and she had done what she did, but the, I, I still had a, a hope that was to belong to my father, right? I needed to belong. And now that I found him, he, he came and he wasn't there when I got there to the, the, the place where he worked with the family business but he came back because I left the address and everything in the telephone and somebody called me one day I was playing with some kids and they said well come back to the house now because your father's here and he came to meet you and I you know I I usually I say that I don't forget that day ever in my life and I don't forget any of the, the any, any of the moments that I went through because, you know, it was again my dream coming true. Now I was sure that my life was going to have um, a meaning yeah. to it because I was going to belong to If my father came back for me, because he wants me as right. his daughter and he's going to take care of me and all the nightmares and all the, you know, the bad people that comes to me, my father will be here to, to protect me. And yes, he took me home and he had a, a wife and two half-sisters, 
and um, they took me to their house every week, and they would come. He would come to school and pick me up. And uh, there's a story that you've heard that already. It's that um, I, every Friday he would come and to get me, and I would just hide right before we were going to be released from school. I would just get out of the classroom and hide in the library, because I just wanted to hear some people looking for me and not just like getting out and go get your father get in the car and nobody sees no I had for so many years I had had to in endure some of my friends saying you know you're not good your parents didn't want you no I want them mm. now to confess that I had a father <coughs> and I wanted them to see that so they would be looking for me and I would hear teachers and my friends going around the, the the school and ask, have you seen Debbie? Where's Debbie? Her father's here. Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, Debbie's father's here. Have you seen her? Find her. And it was just like so wonderful for me to hear my friends saying that, that mm -hmm. I had a father and he was there for me. Mm -hmm. I wanted them to see how beautiful he was, how handsome, mm -hmm. how special. And I would just get out of my hiding place and go and meet him. Oh, yes, I'm here. Good. And just go mm -hmm. with him for the weekend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was very special time for me. Yeah. But it, it didn't end there because on one uh, fateful day your dad came to pick you up yes. and what? Well, yeah, he took me back to the house as always. My, my half-sisters weren't there, my stepmother wasn't there, but she would come later with the kids. Um, it wasn't that day the kids were sent to another, to an aunt's house and um, she wasn't there, he was alone, he took me to the house and um, so he, um, he abused me, he sexually abused me. Mm -hmm. And not only that, I, you know, it was devastating for me but I waited for, he left the house and I waited for my um, stepmom to come back because I didn't even know how to get on a bus and go back to right. the place mm -hmm. I was living. So she came back and then I told her what happened and she said, no, 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 that, you got it wrong. Mm -hmm. That's not, you know, your daddy loves you. And I wanted to hear that. So I stayed with her and then he came back and they both abused me. Mm -hmm. okay. So, yeah. So my, my, my dream became a nightmare. The, the prince that I thought was coming to rescue me became a monster. It, I was devastated and that's when I, I for the first time in my life, I realized, you know, my life really doesn't have any meaning. I really don't deserve to be here in this, in this world. So mm -hmm. for the first time, I thought about taking my life. How old were you at this time, and what, what happened in the yeah, years I was following? Maybe close to 14 years old. Wow. Um, well, people didn't even ask what happened. They were just accusing me. You, ha you did something wrong. Mm -hmm. Because for them not to call, where are they, them? They're not, I thought they were taking you back to live with them, mm -hmm. and they have not called and not anything. What did you do? So, you know, and I could not tell them what they had done, not me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel confident enough to share with them. But one day I, I, I shared with a teacher at school, and um, that's when she, she took me to live with her. Mm. And then she started to take care of me, and um, for a couple of years, I was taken care of. So God has always provided someone to come, step in, and, and be there when I needed. That, that's God. Yeah. So when did you make a personal commitment to Jesus? I understand as a young child, you saw this picture. You recognized that this man in the picture was Jesus. He loved yeah. you. You, you had heard a little bit ab about, about Judaism from some uh, foster parents that mm -hmm. you had lived mm -hmm. with. You had heard a little bit uh, from the Seventh-day Adventist uh, perspective. So truth wasn't really clear to you yet. The only thing that was really clear to you was Jesus. Yes. So how did truth come <clears throat> clear to you? It took many, many years because the, I was really deceived with all these things growing up and believing in many different things. Like I said, I believe that 
Jesus was one person and God was another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, one interesting thing that happened is that, remember the picture that I used to see as a child of the, the little girl sitting on Jesus' lap? Well, when I moved to Connecticut 21 years ago, I met this lady and her husband and one day in a conversation, it came about that um, her father was an artist, and he was the one who painted that, that picture. What a small world. What a yeah. small world, yes. And then the she picture gave me, that changed your whole life. Yeah, not only that, her, uh, her father used to use her and her brother oh. is to the paint, to, paint to, to take the oh. picture and paint from the picture. So yeah, I got to meet the little girl who sat on oh. his left and yes. <laughs> I love that. It is amazing. It's only by God, right? Yes. Right. So um, then later on, I decided that um, when I moved to Connecticut, I decided that, well, I'm going to, you know, I, um, I'm half Gentile, I'm half Jewish. So let me go and do some of the Jewish factor here. Let, let, me, let me explore and leave that. So I did. And I became a very, very legalistic to the point where I took the, if you know, the Nazival. I, I became, a, um, you know, that you cannot um, drink any wine, you cannot cut your hair. Basically what Samson did once. So, okay. yeah, <laughs> I did that. So it was very legalistic, and, but I still, I, still, I, I, I still had Jesus as my 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 friend my savior but i i the, the aspect of like who god is and in the purpose in the gospel i did not know what the gospel was mm -hmm. so when i came to realize well the gospel is that god came to save me god is jesus jesus is he he, he was he died for me god died for me on the cross so that's when i made a commitment i said i i cannot live without you mm -hmm. i i from this day forward, I'm yours. Yes. And I knew there was the, the, the right guide and my savior. So mm -hmm. I made a commitment and I got baptized in a, in a Christian church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is so wonderful. And Debbie, knowing you, you just ooze with the love of God, the presence of God. You want to share Jesus. I can't tell you how many times you know, we'll just be talking at Bible study. Oh, I saw a lady at the gas station and I just asked her, do you know Jesus? Do you know that he loves you? You know, you are a roaring lamb, Debbie. You are. And what a great example and an inspiration to me. Um, and I love the fact that your story is mentioned, or not just mentioned, it's told in our book, um, Stories of Roaring Faith, Volume 3. We have five volumes working on number six. And Debbie's was the first one I read because she gave me the book and she said, my story's in there, you need to read it. And what I loved about it is it packed a punch. It really showed your whole story, but I could read it quickly in maybe 10 or 12 minutes. And so these books are filled with all of these stories of, of different people's stories, all walks of life of how God has transformed their life and how God has worked through pain, through tragedy, yeah. through all of it. And so my question to you is, you know, some people might think, well, I don't have a grand story like that. I wasn't sex trafficked. I wasn't abused. You know, I don't have a story. But we believe everybody has a story, right? Everybody has a story. And yes. why do you think it's important for each person to share his or her story? Because what happened to you, even though it doesn't define you, but that's what gives you strength for, or, or you can use both ways. You can use your past to be a victim of your past and just leave as that, letting that victimizing spirit define you, or you can gain strength from that and rise above it. So when I, I share my story and I tell people that I rose abo above it, I, I, I can give you some, some strength also. You know, it's like if, if, if God did for her, She's not different than me. I want people to see that he did for me, he'll do it for you also. Because God loves me as much as he loves you. And one of the things about your story that I've always been impressed with is forgiveness. Yeah. I mean, you literally had to forgive your mother for abandoning you. You had to forgive your father for abusing you. You forgave the man who your mother sold yes. you to and forgiveness is something that you have learned 
is important to yes. you. So, um, well, you know, when I, I I met my cousin once, and I learned, she told me that my father abused her also, mm. and I told her this. I said, "Why do you have such?" She said that she hated my father. I said, "What? Why do you have such a big place in your heart for my father?" And she was so upset, and she said, "I have no place for him in my heart." Like, yes, you do. You using all this hatred in your heart for him when you and he's dead already. What he did for you was in the past. It doesn't define you. That's the thing. The past does not define you. And what you did wrong for me in the past, I'm not gonna let you do wrong for me in in my my present. So I said, you need to forgive her, forgive him. And I told her what he had done for me. And for her, it was like. How can you forget what he has done, what he did? I can't. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, no, I'm not asking you to forget because God didn't ma make us to forget. Like, you know, I have an amazing mind. I remember everything. It's just that when you, you forgive, it's just like you throw a towel on top of the pain and now you can recollect everything that was said and done, but with a different perspective because now you don't have the place for the hatred in your heart. Mm -hmm. And actually, you know, I, at some point I, I was praying and asking God, and I felt like even love for my father and for my mother, because, you know, they gave to me what they had, and they had nothing. Mm -hmm. Like I say, you know, some people, they're so poor that all they have is just money. Mm -hmm. Right. Right? Right. So my, my parents, my parents, my father, my mother, they gave me what they had to offer. And they gave you life, <clears throat> and you and have been get, yes. such a good steward of mm -hmm. your life. You share your pain, you share what you've learned, you share how yes. you forgive, you share with a lot of different people about yeah. things that have happened to you in your life and how God has redeemed them. Yes. So I would love for you to take a minute or two and speak directly to our audience, because I know that there are people watching this who need to hear what you have to say. Yeah, what I say is, uh, what I always say is that do not let your past define you. Don't be defined by your past or the things that happened to you in your life because you're much more than that. And you are not, um, your identity is with Christ, is with God who made you. And uh, it's nothing else. But when you see that, that you are a child of the light, that God has taken you from the, the, the darkness, literally, and gave you the opportunity to have an eternal life one day. And you have been born again because His Spirit lives in you. There's no chance that you're going to hate those who hated you or those who he did something bad for you because the only thing in your heart that will flow from your heart through your mind through, through, through your mouth is to tell those about the love of that who loved you first. So the love of God in your heart will transpire and we will be willing to, like uh, I went to Brazil like uh, three, six months ago maybe, and you all know I came down with COVID and it was a very, very bad situation when I thought that I was going to die basically. And I could not fly back but um, before I got really sick, I just put a, ma a mask and um, like, you know, the, the little shield? glass shield. And I would go um, to the street because I saw there were a lot of um, hom homeless people, really bad situation like with the lockdown and everything. So I would get some money wrapped in a piece of paper and I would just go and wake them up and say, hey, I have money here. Do you want to go buy some bread? And before they got their money, I would say, well, this, this is money to buy you bread that will make you hungry again. But before I give you this money, let me tell you about someone who is the bread of life. And if you eat from him, you will never be hungry again. And I would just give them the whole story of the gospel, which is found in 1 Corinthians 15. And I had never found, I mean, it was an amazing thing for me to really know what God came, God sent his son, um, he died for me, he resurrected, and he's coming back. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. 
so it is amazing for me. So I want to tell them. And then there was a time when someone got up and said, can you please tell him to come back now? Can, he come, can you ask him to come back right now? So yeah, so I, I think that that's what ro being a Rolling Lamb is, go in exactly. and tell him. Yes. The, that's exactly yeah. right. So, yes. mm -hmm. That's a, exactly right. But it starts with having Jesus in your heart. You can never forgive those that hurt you. You could never forget. You can never do some of those things that Debbie has done without Jesus in your heart. You heard her tell you the gospel that Jesus died on the cross so that his blood would cover your sins as though they never happened. And you would be white as snow to come into a right relationship with God the Father. Mm -hmm. And that's what our desire is even doing this show is to show you real life people that testify to the fact that Jesus Christ coming into your life makes all the difference in this world. Life is hard, but we weren't made to live life on our own. We were made to live life with God through his son, Jesus Christ. Won't you pray and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior today? If you do, I know Debbie would love to hear from you. If you have any questions uh, that you would like to ask Debbie, you can reach her at D Buffoni, that's her name, D B U F F O N E, at roaringlambs.org. She does so much for our organization. She has her own mailbox right here at <laughs> Roaring Lambs. So you can reach out to her at D Buffoni at roaringlambs.org. And Tiffany and I would love to hear from you as well. Uh, you can reach us at info at roaringlambs.org. And if you would like to read Debbie's story in that book or any of our other books, Stories of Roaring Faith, just email us and let us know. So you've been listening to Roaring Lambs. We hope you heard the truth today. We hope you heard the power of Jesus today. And we hope, as Debbie said, that you will go out and tell somebody else about Jesus. Go out and roar. At Life Stories Company, our passion is to preserve your story in a personal memoir. These beautiful books can be shared with both friends and family for generations. For the past 28 years, we have helped over 200 clients share their history and wisdom. As a Christian, what better testimony than to share how God has led you and provided for you? Visit us at lifestoriescompany.com. Sharing your story and honoring God, lifestoriescompany.com.